So this is our uh, Info Trail Building School. Can everyone see the screen on our right back there? Everyone? Okay. Um, so the idea behind this presentation is to give you all uh, a better understanding of how you can be involved in trail development in your area. We have folks from Wichita, Arkansas, and where else? Is that Fort Scott. Fort Scott. Is that three it? hours easier. Three hours easier. All right, perfect. Well, thanks, thanks for coming out and being involved. Um, so we're going to go over some, some great uh, trail building techniques in this presentation. It's really a lot about the, the process of trail development and, and how you can be involved with it. So, so this is what we're going to cover today. We're going to break it into three bite-sized segments, somewhat bite-sized segments. Uh, it's a lot of information, I'm going to tell you that right now. Um, but I guarantee you there's going to be at least one portion of this that's going to really draw you in and you're going to be very interested in no matter what it is that you like about trails and what component of them you want to be involved in. We're going to give you a quick introduction to IMBA, what IMBA is all about, why we're here in Wichita, and hopefully how we can help you guys continue to develop trails in a positive and sustainable manner. We're going to go over trail building evolution, how it's evolved from its historical significance all the way up to uh, suiting different forms of recreation as it does today. We're going to go over sustainable trails, why sustainable trails are important and how they can be integrated into your current trail systems. We're going to go over how to design and build successful trail systems to suit various forms of recreation, especially mountain biking, and how to really provide a variety of uh, experiences for your users. Then we're going to go over some trail maintenance techniques, how to really create uh, better trails that you already maybe have on the ground that may not be constructed in the most sustainable manner initially. And hopefully these trail maintenance techniques will help you just uh, start to analyze your trails a little bit more and, and how you can really improve upon what's already on the ground. Because a lot of the times we don't have blank canvases to start out with. We have trails that are already on the ground and maybe they were constructed really well and maybe not. Most likely they were constructed just by users who were going out there using them and they didn't really take the time to design and plan for the different forms of recreation that we're seeing on them today. So those trail maintenance techniques are a great uh, addition to that. There will be some pop quizzes throughout the entire presentation, and we do have some really cool IMBA socks that we're giving away for those pop quizzes, so pay attention, take notes, whatever you need to do. So we'll dive into it here. So IMBA stands for the International Mountain Bicycling Association. We were formed in 1988 by five groups of mountain bikers actually in Northern California. Those groups of mountain bikers were losing access to their single track trails. They were seeing an influx of development and they were seeing just a lot more people uh, out there on the trails and, and a lot of people had a problem with, with mountain bikers and because they were kind of the new kids on the block, they needed to get together, they needed to get unified and they needed to educate. They needed to educate that greater community about mountain bikers and their interests and, and how they can uh, help steward those trails that they, they work on. So IMBO was, was developed to help educate and advocate for that mountain bike access. Currently, we have 80,000 IMBO constituents in all 50 states and 30 countries around the world. We work very closely with 750 chapters and clubs, like the Kansas Single Track Society here in the Wichita area. And then 800 bicycle retailers, so those local bike shops, like the Heartland, uh, Heartland Bike Shop, is that the name of it? Yeah, that we, we actually gave a presentation in on Thursday, so those uh, supporters really help us continue to grow those communities that we work in. And then 250 corporate supporters help fund programs like our Trail Care crew here today. IMBA's mission is to protect, create, and enhance great mountain biking experiences. Though it does say mountain biking, 99% of the trails that we work on are multi-use trails. So we are about that single track natural surface trail and getting people outside and enjoying the natural landscape through that trail access. We are really excited about the future generations getting outside on trails, whether it's through mountain biking, uh, through trail running, hiking, whatever it may be. We want kids outside and enjoying that natural, uh, natural landscape and appreciating it as well. Our program is really founded around volunteer education because the volunteers are really the ones that are on the ground helping steward these lands and really helping uh, the, those local land managers understand what those trail users are interested in. IMBA and IMBA affiliated clubs volunteer more than one million hours of trail work annually. So we're the ones on the ground uh, helping maintain, helping construct, and helping develop really great sustainable trails. 
programs like our Trail Care Crew have helped uh, educate more than 150,000 people on how to design and build sustainable trails. So that's exactly what you guys are in this room today learning about, and hopefully you're going to uh, be able to take the knowledge that you're learning today and be greater or more involved in your in your greater community. This is our new office located in Boulder, Colorado. We currently have, I actually need to change that number, we have 65 full-time employees both in the office and in the field. We also have lawyers and lobbyists working in Washington, D.C. to make sure that mountain bikers have a seat at the uh, land management and public lands table and discussion. We are the Subaru IMBA Trail Bear Crew. Our program is 100% funded by Subaru, so none of the IMBA membership dollars go into our extended road trip around the country. Lonnie and I essentially sign on for a two-year contract, and we are in a new community each and every weekend. So our goal is to take what we're seeing around the country and share all the great things that we're seeing and all the great progress uh, through presentations like this one today. So my name is Jordan Carr. That is my partner over there, Lonnie Brunts. We are here all day. We are excited to be here at Camp Horizon, and we are excited to be here in, uh, in Kansas. So again, thank you so much for having us and uh, being so enthusiastic about what you guys have going on here. So this is an example of a two-year trail pair crew stint. You can see, we do see the good, bad, and the ugly of all things single track trails. But there are single track trails all over the country. Uh, this is actually the previous cruise stint. We have actually branched out a bit. We've already been to South Dakota. We're headed to Wyoming. Um, so just a great example of, of what we're seeing throughout the country. And no matter what type of landscape you have in your area, there are ways to cre create really amazing trails. And we're going to talk a lot more about that later on in the presentation here. So we are really fortunate to work with a lot of different land management agencies. We actually were just in Colorado uh, for our past few visits where we were working with the Forest Service and BLM, so federal lands. Uh, we work with private land managers in certain cases. Uh, we work with cities, counties, all those different agencies. So that's really the focus of a lot of the work that we do is helping develop those relationships with land management agencies and showing them that mountain bikers, they have that best interest. They're really excited about being involved and they're really excited about uh, uh, stewarding those trails that we all use. So that's really, really the focus of, of what we're doing. And again, thank you all for coming out and being involved. This is our advocacy triangle. So what you guys are doing today, you're focusing on that physical side. You're in this room, you're getting educated, you're going to learn how to uh, design and construct sustainable trails that are going to be a real huge asset to your community. Hopefully this experience is going to get you really excited about advocacy and about the trails potential here in Kansas. You're going to go back to your community, whether it's Bentonville, whether it's Wichita, whether it's uh, Scott, Fort Scott, I was going to say Scotts Valley. Um, and hopefully, you're going to bring a big group uh, into advocacy. You're going to get them really excited and passionate about that, that potential trail development in your area. That's what's going to speak really loudly to those political leaders. So those land management agencies, those public officials who are making the decisions on what's happening with our public lands, with our tax dollars and our funding for those public lands. And hopefully, we can continue to get more and better trails on the ground and, and more organization within those trails. So we want to focus on this little quote there in the middle. It's great trails that build community, so it's those trails that we already have on the ground that brought us in the room today and got us excited and passionate about what trails have to offer. But it's these communities, it's groups like KSS uh, that are continuing to build great trails and continuing to develop better organization within those trail systems and create those varieties of experiences for the upcoming generations and people who are getting out there uh, and recreating. So again, thank you all for having us and thank you all for coming and being involved. Whoops, we'll start along. Okay, well, okay. So I'll just transition to trail building and the evolution of trail building. Because mountain biking has become one of the most popular outdoor recreation activities and it's largely attributed to the evolution of trail building. So I'll touch on the history and then discuss how we've evolved to build these trails to suit different forms of recreation and how we've evolved our techniques so that we're building more sustainable tra trails. So does anyone know who these men are? What were those? My grandpa. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the Civilian Conservation Corps. 
This photo is from the 1930s. These men, they're bent over, they're building a bench cut trail. This is exactly what we'll be doing this afternoon. So the whole idea of these bench cut trails is to keep our users on the trail and the water off of the trail. So it's a technique that's been around for decades now. We've just evolved it to better withstand the test of time and weather and to also suit different forms of recreation. So here in Finnegal, Italy, they had this really steep hillside that they had to figure out how to put a trail on. And they used it for trade centuries ago. You can see over 200 years later, this trail is still intact. So they used a technique called pitch stone paving. It's still a technique we use today in our trail building. Um, the reason we show this is that we don't need to reinvent the wheel. The trails have been around for a long time. They've had a much more significant historical, or much greater historical significance than simply recreation. So we can learn from past successes and past failures and, and build on that. So here in Wales, Great Britain, they see a lot of rainfall, over 100 inches of rainfall a year. And unfortunately, we can't control the weather. Instead, it's a matter of understanding our local weather conditions and adapting to them. So here in Wales, they came up with this idea of elevating the trail tread here. And that actually rises those users up off that wet surface and it allows them to recreate pretty much year-round, regardless of the weather. And so now, trail users, rather than getting out there on those wet, soggy, washed-up trails, they're able to recreate. They don't destroy their bikes. They're having a good experience aren't getting destroyed in the process. So here in British Columbia, they just wanted to bypass this one sensitive riparian zone. And unlike Wales, they didn't have a surplus of rock. Instead, they had a surplus of cedar. So they just built this elevated bridge to get those users through that area. So it opened up this area to those users. And again, it, it protected the area. It allows them to get through with very minimal impact. So here in Seattle, Washington, they have a completely different problem. They are very pressed for, well, one, public space, um, but they also had to get creative with the land on hand. So this sits right underneath I-5. And the local bike club came up with this idea of actually putting a bike park underneath I-5. And it really took quite a vision because there's a lot of negative activity going on underneath the interstate. But as soon as they developed those trails, and got all of those eyes on those trails, people using that area, it really cleaned the area up. And now the mountain bikers have a place to go out and play. There's also an area for people to walk their dogs. So it's really provided a safe area for people to get outside and recreate. So again, there's a matter of understanding the resources they had on hand and the space they had available to them. And they got creative and came up with a way to get trails on the ground. So now we're actually seeing this shift to hiring in professionals to build what we call bike optimized trails. So people are realizing how fun it is to ride trails that were actually designed for our bikes. And communities and towns are realizing all the faces that these sorts of trails are bringing to town. It's bringing a lot of money. It's um, really reinvigorating local economies. And so we're seeing this shift throughout the country where those professionals come in and they do everything from that design to the actual construction so that they can build these trails so they are bike optimized and they're built very purposefully. Uh, it makes the process more efficient, but it is nice to have that variety, to have those bike optimized trails, but to also have more of those legacy trails that so many of us enjoy. These are all just examples of how a trail can be sustainable. So at the end of the day, it's a matter of understanding our local constraints weather, soil, vegetation, any sort of environmental constraints and any sort of environmental opportunities and adapting to those constraints and taking advantage of those opportunities. But it's also a matter of understanding who will be using the trail. So with these bike optimized trails, we're really creating an experience for a particular type of user group. Um, but we do have to think about all the different user groups who will be out there on the trail and actually construct these trails for those. Jordan will define exactly what we mean by sustainable trails. So I know we talk a lot about sustainable trails because when we're working with land management agencies, a lot of them have uh, diminishing resources. So we want to put trails on the ground that are not going to create more work for them and are not going to drain their, uh, their uh, minimal resources. 
But what is a sustainable trail? At Imba, we define a sustainable trail with three key principles. The first one being that environmental component that Lonnie talked about. We need to understand all the, the uh, vegetation, all the plants, all the animals, and then all the local weather that's taking place out on there out on that particular trail system. So that we can have as minimal impact to that surrounding ecosystem as possible. Next is that social component. We need to understand all the different users that are going to be out there on that particular trail. Is this trail going to be open to hikers, equestrians, mountain bikers, motorized users? We have to take them all into consideration during that planning phase so that we can construct a trail that everyone's going to be able to play nicely on. And lastly, the economic component. If we're having to go out and we're having to reroute or reconstruct or constantly maintain certain sections of trail, it's going to be a huge drain on our resources. Whether we're a volunteer organization or we're a land management agency, we don't want to be constantly worrying about those problems on the trail because they were constructed poorly to be. So it's really all three of these things that need to be taken into consideration to construct uh, the most sustainable trails as possible. Can anyone tell me what this area is here? The Grand Canyon. Yes, the Grand Canyon. The Grand Canyon is not a mountain bike trail itself, but there is a really cool new mountain bike trail being constructed on the north rim of the Grand Canyon called the Rainbow Rim. You should definitely check it out if you're ever out in the area. It is absolutely amazing with absolutely amazing views. Uh, but the reason that we show this slide is because it's a really drastic example of what wind, water, and gravity can do to a landscape over time. And when we're constructing our trails, we have to think about wind, water, and gravity so that they don't turn into little grand canyons like these trail examples here. So what we have down on the left-hand side is what we call a user-created trail. This trail was constructed because some people wanted to get from point A to point B as quickly as possible. As quickly as possible is usually straight up the hillside. And as weather continued to happen on this particular hillside, uh, we started to see some erosion taking place. And people continued to use this particular trail. And because that erosion was taking place in the middle, our users had to go to either side to avoid that erosion. And now you can see that once nice trail is just a huge scar on that hillside and it's going to be very difficult to restore in that particular case. In the top example, we have, another, again, another older legacy trail where very little planning took place during the construction of that. You can see that water has been running down that trail for many, many years and it has eroded that trail away as it has done so. You can see that there have been some trail stewards and some land managers who have gone out there to try to minimize the velocity and momentum that that water is able to gain by putting in water bars. But once a trail is eroded to that point, it's just a big scar on the landscape. It's not a very good experience for our users, and it's just really detrimental from a maintenance standpoint. Down on the bottom right-hand corner there, we have what we like to call a rake and ride trail. We had some mountain bikers who just wanted some trails in their area, that wanted some trails in their backyard so that they could get outside and ride. But what they didn't understand was their local soil and their local topography and their local weather. So after only one year of riding on this particular trail, it collapsed in on itself. And that is one of our co-workers there, Collins. He is six foot six. Uh, so you can just see what a huge scar that is left on the landscape. <coughs> So much sediment was sent down into the watershed because of that trail collapsing in on itself that it was just a really, really big problem for the land management agency. So it looks really bad for the mountain bikers in that particular case when those types of things happen. So when we're taking the time to construct these trails, it's really vital that we're taking the time up front to, to really construct trails that are going to last and not be a big problem for our land management agency. So the first thing we need to understand is water. We want to understand that water is always going to go downhill, and with enough volume and velocity, water will move soil and create erosion. Water doesn't like to change directions, so any directional changes we can integrate into our trails, the better, because it's going to minimize that velocity and that momentum that that water is able to, to gain. Lastly, water clings to surfaces and itself. So if water is pooling and puddling on our trail tread, it's going to attach itself to our users and it's going to get transported to other areas, continuing to uh, expedite uh, that, uh, that soil displacement process. And we really, really want to minimize that pooling and puddling because it really, really minimizes how much time we're able to spend out there on that particular trail. 
So if we understand that first characteristic of water and that it's always going to go downhill, there's going to be one main thing that we want to avoid in our trail construction, and that is the fall line. The fall line is the steepest route of descent down a slope. Water will always travel down the fall line, no matter what the case, because water wants to get to the bottom of the hill as quickly as possible, and that fall line is the easiest and fastest way down that hillside. And if we construct a trail directly on the fall line, you can just see as that water travels down that fall line just exactly what it is going to do to that trail. It's going to take a lot of soil with it as it travels down that hillside. And once a trail is eroded to the extent that this one is here, there is absolutely no fix for it. It's going to be a huge scar on that landscape for many years to come. And it's not really providing a very good experience for our users because that doesn't look like a very fun, fun uh, trail to make it up. So the only thing you could probably do in this case is put stairs in, and that's going to be a huge drain on your resources. So instead of building our trails on the fall line, we like to focus on what we call contour trails. Contour trails are great because they're erosion resistant and low maintenance, and they keep our users on the trail while allowing water to work its way off of the trail. In this photo, this, uh, this hillside actually shows the natural contours of this particular hillside. So if we were to be constructing uh, a trail on this particular hillside, we'd want to meander along that hillside, gaining and losing elevation in a much more gradual manner and avoiding that fall line as much as we possibly can. What? Oh, sorry. Can anyone tell me the difference between these two trails now that we have those great new terms? Fall line. Fall line and contour. Exactly. So the top example is a fall line trail, and the bottom example is a contour trail. The great thing about these two photos is that they are the exact same trail. So they have all the exact same vegetation, they have all the exact same soil, they have all the exact same users out there on those trails using them. The only thing that's different is how they were constructed in relation to that particular hillside that they are traversing across. So you can just see how vital it is to take the time and understanding that local topography so that you can construct trails that are going to stay nice single track trails uh, as compared to that one that's becoming very eroded and becoming uh, basically a huge scar on that landscape. But building sustainable trails doesn't mean that we have to be taking the challenge and the enjoyment out of those particular trails. It doesn't mean that we're con constructing sidewalks through the woods. We just need to understand how we can create that challenge and how we can create that difficult nature but do so in a much more sustainable manner. It doesn't always have to be building a trail directly down the fall line to build the most difficult trail. It's just a matter of thinking about how we can integrate in that challenge by using things that we have on hand and doing so in a much more sustainable manner. So we have a quick uh, video from Oregon. This is uh, Sandy Ridge, Oregon. This is about an hour outside of Portland. And this was a, a ground up project that was constructed by the Input Trail Solutions program and it's uh, highlighting a double black diamond trail that was constructed in a very, very sustainable manner but also very extremely challenging. So we'll play this really, really quickly here. Mm -hmm.
this system serving somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 to 50 thousand annual visits. So the number of visits has actually tripled since that video. Um, but those are all examples of really bike optimized trails that is actually an area that's only open to bikes, but adjacent to it there's an area for hikers. Um, and again, you can really see how they were able to manipulate the environment to really create a certain type of experience. And they have everything from that double black diamond trail all the way to green trails. Uh, so they, they really try to facilitate that progression throughout the whole trail system. But moving on, um, now that we are all on the same page about what a sustainable trail is and understand the difference between the fall line and the contour trail, we will get into the five essential elements of designing a sustainable trail. But before we do that, I'm going to quickly review grade because most often as trail builders, the mistake we make is building a trail that's simply too steep, so we see that erosion. So understanding grade, which is the measure of steepness, will go a long way and it applies to all five of the principles of sustainable trails. So to find grade is essentially the slope, so rise over run. So if we have gained six feet of elevation over 100 feet of trail, we would have a 6% grade. When we're out in the field, it's not possible to measure that out. It would take way too much time. It wouldn't be accurate. So luckily, we rely on a tool that's called an inclinometer. So these inclinometers actually give us the percent grade from point to point in the field. So that way, we're able to just quickly shoot um, how steep that side slope is that we're working on, how steep that trail is that we're flagging and designing in. So quickly, I'll just give you the rundown on how to use this tool. When you peer through the lens, this is what you'll see. If we focus on the numbers on the right side of the dial, they give us percent to, or the percent grade. Um, sometimes it's different, so just check and make sure you're reading percent, but all of ours are on the right side. And the dial swivels up and down depending on if you're shooting uphill of yourself or downhill of yourself. So we've already been working with a partner where you're first getting familiar with this tool. So we'll just demonstrate how to do or how to use this tool with a partner, and then we'll talk about options afterwards. So Jordan, if you wouldn't mind demonstrating with me. So before you can go out into the field, you have to establish your zero point. So that's going to be the point on your partner's body that you consistently um, point your your line your inclinometer up to to establish how steep whatever it is that you're working on. So level ground about five to ten feet apart from each other. You want to stand with a posture that you can keep consistent in the field. And then you'll hold the clinometer up to your dominant eye. All of these have the string. If it's facing down like this, you know you're looking through the instrument correctly. If it's like so, you won't be able to see anything. So with that string pointed down, hold it up to your dominant eye. And you're going to have to keep both eyes open because there's no viewfinder. When you look through this instrument, you can't see out the other end. And I'll pass this along around after so it makes sense. So you'll keep both eyes open and essentially to find that zero point you line that zero mark up with the horizontal line. And then you're going to superimpose that onto your partner's body to determine where that zero point lies. So there's times where you actually have to, you may need to close your non-dominant eye to focus in on the dial and then you open it back up to see where that zero point lies. So on Jordan, it's right at his collar line. So it's essentially the point on his body that's eye level with me. So that way, when we're out in the field, let's say I'm standing down slope with Jordan, I'll shoot to that same point, so right at his collar. I'll read those numbers on the right side of this dial, and it's about 15% grade. So, can I have two people come up and demonstrate, just in case I left anything out or ran yeah, too long? Yeah. Yep. Thanks. Come on up, Chris. Oh, great. Anyone else? One of you guys from Bentonville. Like that, we know the tears. Come on up, Chris. <laughs> or, uh, I saw you about it. You were getting up, though. All right, so first step, establishing that zero point. So, and if you don't have a partner, you can mark that zero point on a branch or on a stick and carry that out there in the field, or you could find that zero point on branches to guide you. And it takes a while to actually focus in on the screen, so when we pass it around, you'll see. Where's the point? His eyes. Oh, you don't have to look right down. down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, turn the lower eyes at 20%. <laughs> All right, so, yeah, Ben. Want to give it a try? We'll do. Well, and then we'll pass this tool around so you guys can all go through it and 
see how it all works. Um, there are smartphone apps available that have clients on them. They're not quite as accurate as a, as a tool itself, but uh, right. Is it a great way to check what's happening on our particular shows for a reasonable. Uh, it is okay. Great. You're gonna take a seat that way. There's no. Oh, perfect. We're done. There you go. Here's a tip, Laura. Uh -huh. So now that we have a good idea of how we can establish our grade out in the field, we're going to go over our five essential elements of constructing sustainable trails, and they're all somewhat uh, centered around grade. So obviously we're not always going to be able to integrate every single one of these principles into every single foot of trail that we're constructing, but the more that we can integrate these principles in, the more sustainable, so more sustainable our trails will be. So the first one is our half rule. The half rule states that our trail tread grade should be less than half of the grade of the side slope that we're working on. So side slope and fall line are two words that we can use interchangeably because when we're constructing contour trails, we are working across the fall line. So that becomes our side slope. So for the rest of the presentation, if I use the term side slope, that is the fall line. That is the steepest route of descent down that particular hillside that we're working on. So with our half rule, this is great because it keeps water from diverting down our trail tread and keeps it off of our particular trail, reducing the amount of erosion taking place. So you can see that top example. We have a side slope of 20%. The trail builder has gone in and constructed a trail with a 15% grade. You can see that the water is going to work its way down the hillside, hop onto our trail, and because our trail is not only compacted, it doesn't have any vegetation on it, and it's still relatively steep, so the water is going to use our trail as its watershed, is, and it's going to displace soil as it does so. The bottom example follows that half rule. We have that same side slope of 20%, but the trail builder has gone in and constructed a trail that follows that half rule with a grade of 8%. So you can see that the water is going to travel down the side slope. It's going to hop on our trail for a brief moment. It's going to realize that our trail is not the fastest way down the hill, and it's going to continue on down its natural course, not pooling and puddling on our trail or eroding our trail away as it does so. So the first step of this process is to go out into the field. We need to put on our suspenders and our cowboy hat, and we need to <laughs> hop up there on the hillside. We need to establish what our side slope is that we're working on. So in this case, we have a 22% side slope. Any mathematicians in the room want to divide that in half for me and give us our uh, max trail tread grade? Anyone? 11, yes. So if we're constructing a trail on this particular hillside, we want to max our trail tread grade out at 11%. So as we're working our way across that hillside, we don't want any grades greater than 11% to continue to follow that half rule. Number two is our user-based erosion guideline. This one states that on typical soil surfaces, we want to max out our trail tread grade at 15%. We want to max out our trail tread grade at 15% because anything greater than 15%, and it's going to be our users who are the ones who are displacing the soil. So whether it's uh, their feet, their hooves, their bike tires, whatever it may be, any trail that's steeper than 15%, and our users need to dig into that soil to get up or get down that particular section of trail. Of course, this does depend a little bit on soil, but you guys have really good compactable soil, so 15% is a good number to, to focus on for your max trail tread grade. There are some exceptions though. If you do want to create really technically challenging trails and you want to create a specific experience that's based more around speed and uh, descending or ascending, there are ways that we can integrate in that challenge and do so in a sustainable <coughs> way. We can integrate in things like natural rock outcroppings and rock features. We can integrate in build structures, so more uh, wooden type and man-made features. Or we can armor those sections that are steeper in grade. We can uh, harden up that trail tread by using either naturally occurring rock or things like landscape pavers to harden up that trail tread and make them more sustainable in those steeper sections of trail. 
Number three is our average grade guideline. This one states that when designing our trail, we want to keep the overall average grade less than 8%. This allows us to aid in planning, accommodate variations in soil type, minimize that user-based erosion that we talked about, and help with future reroutes. Because the great thing about nature is that it's not always black and white. We're not always going to be able to go exactly where we want to out there in the natural landscape. We're going to run into constraints. We're going to run into rock features. We're going to run into big uh, trees that we aren't able to, to take down. We're going to run into seeps and different water features out there. So if we focus on this average grade of about 8%, we are able to make those adjustments and get around those areas while still keeping our trail as sustainable as possible. But of course, we don't want a straight 8% trail down the hillside. That's not going to be very fun for our users and it's not going to be very sustainable. We want some undulation in that trail. We want some 4%, some 15%, some 7s and some 9s. But as long as we're focusing on that average of about 8%, it's going to keep our trail really sustainable and also create that enjoyment and experience that our users are looking for. So now that we have a bit of a better understanding of what certain grades look like and you know sustainable grades versus unsustainable grades, what do you think the grade of this particular trail is in this photo? 23. 23, less than 23 percent. Less than 10. 3 percent is exactly what it is. So this trail is only 3 percent in grade. Does anyone know? why it is so eroded. It's all in the fallout. Exactly. So this trail is constructed directly on this mellow fall line. So even when we're working on relatively mellow slopes, if we build a trail on the fall line, the water is going to use our trail as its watershed. So it has nothing to do with the helmet that's laying there. It has nothing to do with the helmet that's laying there. That's, that's just showing how eroded that particular section of trail is. So. Extremely eroded, only at 3% in grade. So you really, really need to think about that particular hill that you're working on. Think about that fall line. Understand where that lies and how you can construct a trail that's going to avoid that fall line as much as possible. So if we were to follow the half rule on this particular hill, what would be our maximum sustainable trail trade grade? One and a half. One and a half, yeah. So obviously not a place where we're going to want to build a downhill trail. But it would be a great place to integrate in, you know, maybe a more beginner or a more challenging trail in, in other ways other than by uh, a, a challenging grade. So continuing on with our five essential elements, number four is our trail tread outslope. This one states that when constructing our trail, we want to outslope it by 5% to aid in the sheet flow of water. So we are essentially saying that the outside critical edge of our trail should be 5% lower than that inside edge of our trail. That's going to allow the water to work its way off, it's not going to pool and puddle on our trail tread, and the water is not going to get trapped because of the nature of construction on our trail. So this little slide just highlights how this works out there on the natural landscape. So the water is going to work its way down our hillside. If our trail tread is outsloped right at about 5%, our users are going to be able to stay on that trail and make it through that particular section of trail without sliding off. But the water is going to be able to work its way off of our trail, not pooling or puddling on our trail tread. And it's going to continue on down its natural course and not displace soil as it does so. But when we're out in the field constructing our trails, it's not going to be a very efficient use of our time to be measuring every section of trail with a level to make sure that we have that 5% outslope. But there is a great tool that we almost always have in our hands on trail construction or trail maintenance days. That trail is called a McLeod. A McLeod is a great tool for trail construction and trail maintenance. It does a lot of great things. It does a lot of tamping and finishing work, maybe a little bit of light excavating work, uh, the removal of the organic layer, but it also measures our trail's outslope. So to measure our outslope with a McLeod, we want to imagine a plumb line from the end of the handle to the edge of the blade. If that McLeod is sitting perpendicular on our trail and those two are lining up, our trail is outsloped right at about 5%. So that's going to give us just a a 
good idea of what that 5% outslope looks like and just allows us to check it, just eyeballing it out there. It doesn't have to be exact. We just need to make sure that we have just a little bit of outslope on our trail so that our users will stay on while allowing the water to work its way off. So number five, and last but not least, are grade reversals. Grade reversals are great because they create watersheds along the trail. So grade reversals are essentially small upticks in our trail. And if we remember, water doesn't like to what? Change directions or go uphill. Yeah, exactly. So these grade reversals give the water those low spots. And this diagram just illustrates how those grade reversals help minimize the velocity and the momentum that that water is able to gain. So you can see in the top example there, without the integration of those gray reversals, that water is able to hop on our trail. If it does get stuck on our trail, it's going to gain a lot of velocity and momentum as it works its way down. But if we have those gray reversals integrated in there, we're going to have those low spots for the water to get to. Um, so these gray reversals are not only creating a more sustainable trail tread, but they're also creating a really fun experience for our users because if you're like me, you don't like to be grunting up a, a constant uphill. These gray reversals create those low spots and give you that break to take a quick breath of air and uh, continue on your way. And this video has some horrible music from some point. Um, but you can just see that this, uh, this intermediate level rider is riding this beginner level trail and because of the gray reversals integrated into this particular trail, he is finding a whole other level of enjoyment. So these great reversals are not only making our trails more sustainable, but they're also creating a more roller coaster feel and a really fun experience for our users. So those five essential elements do a lot of things from a sustainability standpoint, but some also create a really, really enjoyable experience for our users. And at the end of the day, we are constructing our trails for our users and we want them to make sure, or we want to create a particular experience for that. Milan is going to talk a little bit more about that experience. Yeah, so those five essential elements, they really address that environmental aspect of sustainable trails. But if you remember, there were three components, and the second component was uh, that social aspect. So understanding who will be using our trails. So if we actually have the time to design and construct a new trail, it's really important that we take into consideration all of the different who will be using that trail and try to understand what kind of experience it is they're looking for so we can try to accommodate them as best as possible so we don't see a uh, user conflict on our trail systems. So to do that, we'd really like to get in the heads of each of the trail users and, and more often than not, we're working on multi-use trails, uh, almost always non-motorized, so we're seeing trail runners, equestrians, mountain bikers, hikers, there are a lot of other trail users out there, so people who like to go bird watching or maybe they're hiking into kayak. But it's these four user groups that are typically more concerned about the experience the actual trail is providing them. So that's why we focus on these four trail users. So our hikers, they're typically out there looking for interesting aspects in the landscape. Oftentimes they're goal oriented. So whether they want to summit a peak or they want to hike into a meadow, or a waterfall. It's important that we understand where those areas are in the landscape and take the trail to those areas for our hikers. Because as hikers, we can easily step off the trail and create a trail of our own to get up to that beautiful viewpoint that the, the trail builder, for whatever reason, forgot to take us to. And in that case, we see a lot of social trails popping up. So for our hikers, we need to Again, find those areas in the landscape that they're going to be drawn to, take the trail to those areas, and try to keep the trail uh, relatively direct. If the trail is direct, the hikers will stay on it and go to those interesting areas of the landscape. So trail runners, they're moving at a much faster pace. Their head's typically down, so they're much more concerned with the actual trail tread itself. As trail runners, they like bright. They like rocks, they like smooth, buffed out, flowy sections, they like it all. What they want is to be able to run one set of mileage today and a completely different set of mileage tomorrow. And so trying to provide some sort of connection between trail systems, so maybe interconnectivity between loops, so that way they have that variety. So the trail runners are looking for a very similar experience as our mountain bikers. 
they're one of the fastest growing user groups, so a great partner to make in the trail building effort. So equestrians are more challenging to accommodate simply because of their size and their weight, but if we're going to have these equestrians on our trails, it's important that we're constructing the trail for them. We do need to think about their experience, so making sure we're cutting any sort of vegetation out of the way, we're clearing it for them so they're not getting knocked around or ducking under branches. Also thinking about access to water so the horses can get a drink out there on the trail system, maybe even access over water. So considering their experience, but also thinking about the trail tread. So if we are having to push steeper grades or maybe we're in a softer section or the trail softer in a particular section, we'll actually need to harden that surface up so it doesn't get eroded away and stomped out by these animals. So there's definitely a spectrum of ability levels and interests within each user group. Uh, but we like to emphasize that spectrum within our user group, mountain bikers, because as trail builders, we usually get a little selfish and think about what it is we want in a trail and we build that trail for ourselves. But it's important to think about all of the different users out there, all the different ability levels, and to remember that there are people who have never been on a bike or people who are just learning how to ride a bike. And we need to create trails that are very welcoming for these beginner mountain bikers. So keeping those trail tread grades nice and mellow, having a smooth surface. Uh, the trail should be wider for these beginners so they're not um, constrained to a 12 inch trail. We'll talk more about this, the specifics that they're looking for, but the idea is to get more people familiar with their bike and able to maneuver their bike and having experiences like this kiddo. Design as well. All right, first pop quiz. 
This one's official, so socks are on the line. So I'll just call on the first hand that I see. So there's two components. So someone needs to name and describe one of those five essential elements of sustainable trails. Yes. <laughs> to those five essential <laughs> elements. Clearly I'm wrong. We do want to go on the contrary, yes. So that's, that goes into um, what is a sustainable trail? So if they're involved in the discussion from the beginning, there's a chance that land may 
land may open up to you down the road. Here, it's pretty unique that you actually get to build on private property, and, and they're kind of giving free reign to the club. It's incredible to see it, and we are seeing that. So, But there are also times where the landowners will have a host of concerns that you have to deal with to really try to keep all those stakeholders as happy as possible. And then finally, so we have challenging natural features, which we also view as a control point. So if we're trying to build very technically an advanced trail, we would seek out these challenging natural features. We would take the trail to these ch challenging natural features. But if we were building a very entry level trail, uh, for example, if the trailhead was right here, you could park and walk a minute to this bluff, we'd have to figure out how to manage the risk of that feature. So thinking about how these features fit within the trail system at large and how we have to manage the risk of these features. So again, oops, there we go. Um, there is a lot that takes place in the planning process, but the more we can understand our environment and the different user groups out there, the better the trail should be down the road and the more sustainable the trail will be. Because <coughs> once we build a trail, we want it to be around for decades, maybe even centuries. We want people to have a good experience out, out there on that trail, so if we can do it right the first time, it'll be a lot more enjoyable.